very early furious. Why don't you play piano first furious? <laughs> Brother Furious, Brother Raj, Raj is here. Okay, how are you, Furious? Where are you hiding? <laughs> Did you hide somewhere? Morning. Good morning, morning pa. Wow. Wala akong ano. Hindi ako nakakuha. Meron ka? Na? Ano yun? Ah, wala din. Okay lang. Ang, ang gawin mo, ang gawin mo, uh, dala, ano, picturean mo siya. Ah, tis dito. Papakita ko na Meron kaming ganyan na. Nakikita mo ba? Oo. Hindi ko mak Ba't hindi ko makita lahat yung uh, mga nakain? Kasi yung iba po, hindi po sila naglalagay ng screenshot nila. Tama ba? Ay, is that your question? Bakit hindi makita? Ano lang? One. Hi, Ferius! Dr. Ferius! Yeah. Very fat. So... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine? Nine people, though? So far? Actually, we have 18. Nine. Yeah, but, uh, uh 18? Yeah. For me, nine pa lang. Yeah. They're logging in, in, in the process. Okay, see that to me. Yeah. We have 18. And the pass. I'll still enjoy it. Full screen. Yeah. I'll still enjoy it.
somewhere. Dr. Jim, I think you're Dr. Flores is ready to give the lecture, but I think setting. Uh, did I unmute him? Mute him. Have to unmute. Yeah, I already. Did I unmute everybody? No. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jeff, can you unmute yourself? Okay. Okay, now. Okay. Yes, can that's you hear me it. Now? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. The other, the other thing, Dr. Jim, is you have me blocked from sharing the screen. So you need to unblock me so I can share the screen. Okay. Uh, Mike, how do I do that? Um, you, you were the administrator, so I don't know. So if you do your share screen, I think you need to share a screen with Dr. Jeff. Okay, okay. Yeah, it just says uh, host share. disabled attendee because I'm okay. as an attendee. Okay, okay. Uh, have you seen it? Is it not possible, Dr. Jen? You, you can let him to share his PowerPoint. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dr. So, Jin, uh, do that in your setting. Go to, okay. uh, go to the zoom.us okay. and, uh, and then log in with your account and then with your profile and the setting. And then you go okay. to the setting and then, then you can select, I, let all persons share the screens or only yourself. Okay. After that, then you are, you are able to let uh, Dr. Jeff to share the screen. Because okay. you are, the, uh, uh, okay, I'm right here. Another way to do uh, two minutes is you, you give the, the host to Jeff, but you cannot admit any other person into this meeting anymore. Okay, I will have to, to I think, uh, give him the host. Okay, uh, that will be very difficult. We, we, we have hard time because he's the presenter but he still have to do the admission of uh, you know, people into the meeting, which will make a lot of uh, headache for, for him. Right, right. You just so, unblock everybody? Yeah. Were you able to do it, Dr. Jeff? Not yet. I'll try again. Hi, Stanley. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. How about you? I'm good. Great. Okay, hold on for a minute. I'm trying to look at the check the the host. Where is it host in the chat area or in the uh, in the virtual? Uh, you have to go to the not this uh, Zoom page. You have to go to the on to the to the web to the web page. The web page is uh is basically uh when you go to the zoom.us, you log okay. in with your, with your account, and then after logging logging to your account, you will find a profile or setting some uh, and then within the profile and the setting, then you can change the um your setting to be to the share screen. Okay, so. Is this one a, a paid account or a, or a paid account? Yeah, this is a paid account, uh, Dr. J uh, Stan. Oh, okay. that is a paid account. See whether you can share the post to Dr. Jeff. Yeah. Uh, hold on, hold on. Hold on a minute. Dr. Jim, the one at the upper left-hand corner with the share screen, remember? Hello. 
daw doc. Ah, uh, Mike, paano nga yung ano? Paano paano nga yung uh, i-shift ko yung ano? Yung uh, i-shift ko yung tawag nito, yung post sa kanya paano nga yun? Saan ako pupunta? Tapos saan doon? Di ba may may pinindot lang si Tamiya na isa? Okay, sige, sige. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, hold on, hold on. Just trying to fix the... Yes, pass. Yes, pass. In share screen. Huh? Tapos yung sa share screen, saan ko pipindutin? Hello, Tam? Tam? Si... Oo. Oh, emergency lang. Nagkakaproblema si Dr. De Castro sa kanya sa pagpapaano ng Zoom. Pwede mo siyang tulungan. Hello, Tam? Uh -oh, Tam, narinig mo ako? And Hello? careful screen. Uh, maximize the window. Sa sa saan ako doon? Naka Nakapress siya lahat eh. Okay. Okay. Hindi, hindi, hindi ito. Wait lang ha si 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 ano lang. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So I'm sure that they'll figure it out somehow. This is just the baby steps. Yeah, hold on, hold on. I'm just... Uh... <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay, hold on, Dr. Jeff. Yeah. A uh, few more minutes. I'm Googling it right now how to do this. <laughs> do you have somebody helping you do this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody is already doing it. Okay. They're just, just, they're just trying to uh, get the command, and then uh, we'll be we'll be right there. Just find box. Remember, Dr. Jim, if you want yeah. to fix the, the share screen stuff, you want to, go to, your, to your account on the web page, not the Zoom page. It is not on this, uh, this page or you are seeing the, uh, the Zoom right now. Go to, the, go to your account. Okay. So 
go log, you, you, you start your Safari, if you're using a Mac or your uh, IE Internet Explorer, or if you use the PC, then you type in the zoom.us. Right. And then when you type in the zoom.us, and you're going to see uh, your uh, the Zoom login page. Then you then you just log in with your account, and then go okay. to. Let me see what what is what is seeing on the Zoom. So. Okay, then there is a there is a meeting. Oh no, there's a profile. Sorry. Go to the profile, and in the profile, and go to the room management. Go go back to the Zoom. Uh, go back to the to the profile, and then profile you you should be able to see. Um, can you see a personal? Personal there. Sorry, not the profile. With uh, within the personal, there is a profile meeting, webinars, and recording, and the settings. Go okay. to the settings, and then within the settings. Uh... Okay. And then pull down the screen. Keep going down. And then you should be able to see very bottom. You're going to see a screen sharing. Mm -hmm. Setting within the setting. Uh, yeah. Tom is here. Tom. 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 Tamia. Yes. yes. Hello. Good morning, doctors. So what do I do? Go. I will share the. I will transfer the. The host to Doctor. To Doctor Jeff. So where do I go? Go to the participants, Doctor. Okay. Go to the participants, Participant. and, and then. Beside Doctor Jeffrey, you'll have an option. More. Okay. More, and, and then, then. Click make host. Okay. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. All thank right. you. Okay, now Doctor Doctor, uh, sorry for that. Thank you, Tom. Uh, doctor Jeff, you're the host now. Okay, I don't know oh. if I can handle that responsibility, but I'll try. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. That was good. That was good. Okay, now you're the host. The Doctor Jeff. Okay, I'm sorry for that, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have 52 participants right now, and we welcome Dr. Jeff, Thank the mentor much. of the mentors. Right, but I before we begin, um, we'll just have a short prayer. Is that all right with you? Yes, okay, sir. We'll have a very short prayer. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful opportunity that we can share each other's uh, skill and expertise and to share it with the rest of our colleagues. We ask, Lord, for your guidance to be upon us, your Holy Spirit to guide us in all these activities today. We to will be with Dr. Jeff as he presents, Lord, this uh, information. And we ask, Lord, for your guidance and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Dr. Jeff, welcome. Thank you, wow. Dr. Jeff. I should like I, your pictures. Should I go the whole... <laughs> Should I go the whole 30 minutes here, or is there any time constraint? You, you can go as long as you want. Okay. Uh, the minimum is only 30, but you can go more than that. Okay. I like your pictures. Okay. 
So, yeah, well, well, thank you very much. Feel honored to be here in front of everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. And certainly we're having uh, challenging times right now. And I, Dr. Jim, I really appreciate you putting this together. And it looks like you got a great series plan. So um, that's off to Dr. Jim for that. Um, I thought I'd we're calling this MASK. I'm not sure what MASK stands for. MASK stands for uh, Musculoskeletal Active Skills in Ultrasound. Well, well, I noticed that, Dr. Jim, you're the only one not wearing a mask in this picture, so you need to get your mask. All right. I'm from Ohio State in the United States, and we're having these issues, too. I, I'll get right to it since we're... Okay. Okay. Do I need, need to mute people, Dr. Jim? Hello. Yeah, Tom. mute mute everybody. Hello, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Tom. Yeah. Tom. Okay. okay. Anyway. Okay. So let's go back. All right. So learning objectives of this talk, we're going to review different categories of peripheral nerve trauma the different mechanisms for peripheral nerve trauma, and some methods for assessing normal and abnormal and those kinds of circumstances and trauma. The reason I have this picture is things are not always like they appear. So we wanna make sure that we look at them carefully. Um, we'll talk about some clinical scenarios too where ultrasound adds more information than just electrodiagnosis, okay? And this is beautiful Columbus, Ohio, right now actually. That's a recent picture. And a couple of textbooks, so it is disclosures. I don't know what, it, that entails on Zoom, but um, a couple of textbooks um, that I've done. So when, when I'm faced with a peripheral neuropathy or focal neuropathy, um, these are basically the goals I wanna attain with the diagnostics that we're doing. So when, when we're faced with that, we wanna identify the abnormality when it is present. We wanna localize the lesion to the extent that we can. We wanna qualify the relative severity of the lesion and then identify causes and potentially treatable factors. So those are all important things. I'm not gonna get into the treatment in this limited time, but, but all of these diagnostic um, components will help us do the right treatment. Okay, so when we're faced with a neuropathy, there's really three things that can happen to a nerve. And the simplest is, and those of you that do electrophysiology, or if you don't, at least understanding um, what, what the electrophysiology means. The axons can slow. So if there's effect on the myelin, the axons will slow. Axons can block and axons can die. And this axonal death, and that's the most severe um, thing that can happen to a nerve and the less um, um, likely to improve. We, we like to focus a lot on nerve conduction slowing and things like that with electrophysiology. Um, but I will tell you that the slowing that we pay so much attention to really doesn't have a, a big factor when it comes to symptoms. Not whether it's sensory or motor, either one. If there's not you generally don't have any problems, okay? I don't know how to mute. Some of you are making noise. It's hard to hear. There's a couple, Dr. Jim, I can't seem to mute. That's all right. Uh, I, I just would like to request everybody to kindly mute all, all your. Please. Barking dog is close. Okay. So, when it gets to electrodiagnosis and ultrasound, these are complementary technologies. One's a physiologic assessment and one's an anatomic assessment. So we look at them, we have the seed and cloud classification. So there's neuropraxia, um, axonotmesis, and neurotmesis. And those are the really three types um, that we categorize. Okay, so neuropraxia is the least, form, least severe form. I'm gonna, I guess because I'm getting really distracted by somebody that's not muted, so I'm going to just cut the volume down so I can't hear you. The, it's a least form, and it's often related to compression. There's, um, the axons are intact in a neuropraxic injury. 
There's disruption of the myelin and result resulting in interruption of the nerve impulse. There's a temporary loss of function. So these are the ones that were recovered quickly, you know, six to eight weeks. It's often motor greater than sensory and autonomic function spared in this condition. So the distal sensory interaction potentials and compound muscle action potentials are going to be normal in this case, electrophysiologically. Okay, axonotmesis is a more severe type of injury. Okay, it can happen from a crush, contusion, a stretch. It involves disruption of the neuronal axon, but preservation of the epineurium. Okay, so disruption of the axon myelin, um, the preservation of surrounding connective tissues, very critical because if there's still connective tissue, it has a propensity or possibility to heal. Whereas um, if, if there's complete neurotmesis, which we're gonna to get to, there's no ability to heal. Wall area degeneration occurs. Recovery occurs by regeneration, weeks to years, and it takes much longer and often not complete. So it's a much more severe injury. Neurotmesis is entirely different. Okay, and this is the most severe lesion. It has no potential for full recovery without intervention. So this is going to be from a severe contusion, stretch, or a laceration. And the axon encapsulating connective tissues lose continuity. So this is one where we really have to intervene surgically if we determine that that's what the condition is. So we'll have a complete loss of sensory function, um, motor function, and autonomic function. And this is indistinguishable electrodiagnostically from complete axonotmesis. Okay, and that's a critical thing where our imaging comes into play. Um, we, with all the electrophysiologic techniques we have, we can't distinguish these unless there's some active um, neurologic function. Okay, and then we can know there's still some continuity. Okay, and then looking again at these different categories, this, the Seton classification is those three. Sunderland has talked about different categorizations of axonotmesis, okay? And it has to do with how much is in continuity. And this, this is a level that's a little more challenging to see or, and even to diagnose. So those of you that do electrophysiology, those already know this. Some of you are less familiar with electrophysiology. A complete neuropraxic lesion electrophysiologically means that if here's the level of the injury, if we stimulate on this side where the recording here, we'll have no response with a complete neuropraxic injury, but we'll have a normal response distal to the lesion. And if it's incomplete, that means there's um, still a little bit of response, but it's not normal. That's the definition of conduction block. We have axonal loss, then we're gonna have small responses on both sides and that distinguishes axonal loss. And, and that's what's nice about electrophysiology. There's really nothing that tells us what or distinguishes a complete neuropraxic injury from an axonal um, injury other than electrophysiology until we get into things like muscle atrophy and things like that. So this, I thought this dessert looked a little bit like a, a nerve. And, and so I thought I'd point that out. So this is anatomically kind of what a neuropraxic injury looks like. You see some of the, there's some crumbs on the, on the menu here and this outer myelin is disrupted. So, so we can actually visually see that when we inspect it. An axonotmesis has actual damage to the axons. So this would be an axonotmesis and this would be a complete neurotmesis but for, for it's ready to be eaten, okay? And uh, so we know that this without an intervention, if that's a nerve, is not gonna do well. So with nerve trauma, ultrasound has very good reliability for finding these neuromas, things like that. And a neuroma by definition is a well-defined hypochroic mass along the course of the nerve. So it's a focal enlargement and that usually reflects injury. Okay, so these are my list of princ principles for imaging peripheral nerves in general with ultrasound. I know we spend a lot of time talking about whether it's big or not, but here's the principles to obtain good visualization. Number one, correctly identify what you're looking at is nerve tissue. That sounds very basic and straightforward, but sometimes that, that gets violated. I'll even see that in um, manuscripts that are turned in for research and, and they're, they're circling connective tissue and vascular tissue and things that aren't really nerve tissue. And, and so of course you're gonna have um, irregular or, or results that don't make a lot of sense. Use good technique, we'll talk about quickly. Know the surrounding anatomy. Know, use consistent measurement techniques. Always look in both short and long axis. And just like everything we do in the imaging and ultrasound, we say one view is no view. We wanna make sure we always see it in two views. And follow the course of the nerve. Those are all important things. And those are all the principles we use every time we're using ultrasound. 
Okay, and, and what, what are we looking at when we're looking at peripheral nerves? Basically, the level we see with conventional ultrasound, the normal frequencies that we generally use, we're seeing the level of the perineurium. So we have the nerve fibers that are covered by endoneurium, and the bundle of nerve fibers is covered by the perineurium. This is what makes the dark honeycomb or the fascicle. The outer epineurium is the really conspicuous part of the nerve that we used to circle and measure, and the inner epineurium is where there's connective tissue, vascular structures, and, and microtubules that actually help with the nutrients of those nerve fibers. Okay, and there's a little more detail. Okay, so we're starting to more and more find that ultra high frequency or the higher frequency transducers give us even better images of these nerves than we've had before, as long as they're reasonably superficial. This is a 70 megahertz transducer, and this is showing the median nerve here um, just at the distal wrist. And we see here the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve, which will, as I scan distally, you'll see that branch will go into this fascicle of the um, flexor carpi radialis. So at this, this level of resolution, we can really distinguish the fascicular pattern of the nerve and actually see every fascicle and identify them and look at their relative health versus the fibular pattern of this tendon, which is right next to it, FCR tendon. And another example, so this is the ulnar nerve at the wrist. This is the ulnar artery. This is the flexor carpi ulnaris. Um, and you can see the tendon portion of the flexor carpi ulnaris, and this is the muscle portion. And so that's the great thing about this level of resolution is we really distinguish these tissues very well as they start to move. And you can see the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve and actually each, all the number of fascicles that come out and that'll innervate the dorsal part of the hand. So if we start looking at these in better resolution, we can see even small fascicle injuries and that makes a difference in some complicated cases. Here's the, the medial plantar branch and the lateral plantar branch in the tarsal tunnel with ultra high frequency ultrasound. There's the posterior tibial artery. You can see the muscular walls and you can see part of the medial calcaneal branch in the top. So um, again, um, you notice that these look a lot more conspicuous moving, okay? As a general, just a concept, this idea that we can just circle nerves and say if it's bigger than an ordinal number on an ordinal scale sometimes gets us in trouble because we may not be seeing quite what we think we're seeing. An example here is if I start to move this a little bit, you'll notice that these start to come apart. If you had a lower frequency um, ultrasound device, you may not notice that there's a lot of, you know, that these two branches have already come apart, different fascicles are coming apart. And if we just use a set measurement of this whole cross-sectional area, the, the further distal we go in the tarsal tunnel, the bigger, obviously, the, um, the uh, um, cross-section area is going to be, and some of it may be artifactual. So we have to be very careful um, when we're just trying to use ordinal numbers in a very complex regional anatomy. Okay, so, so ultrasound for focal neuropathies. This is helpful in the context of compression, trauma, post-surgical alteration, tumors, and we'll talk a little bit about the trauma part of it. can provide some information about severity can provide more precise localization than electrodiagnosis down to portions of millimeters and can be helpful with peripheral nerve blocks. Okay, so what are, these are some things that we should do when we're inspecting peripheral nerves, okay? We wanna always look at the caliper of it, look for abrupt change in the caliper, include swelling, it may be focal or diffuse, utilize cross-section area and diameter, and that's the most well-studied facet of what we look at with peripheral nerves and has most literature. We wanna, look for contour. Is there irregularity in the contour? Because sometimes there's more than one area of entrapment or one more area of, more than one area of stress. Um, fascicles, this is, to me, is a very important area because the reality is the more severe lesion is going to have disruption of the fascicles. And when you have disruption of the fascicular architecture, that equates with axonal injury. And so the more, some of the severe lesions that we see may not be overly enlarged. We even see that in conditions like monoritis multiplex, where they have ischemic injuries to the nerves beyond the initial swelling from the ischemia. They may actually be smaller, but they're very severe axonal injuries. And so looking for non-uniformity, enlargement, or atrophy, and disruption of those fascicles is a very important part of looking at peripheral nerves. Looking for continuity, of course, if the nerve is no longer in continuity, it's not gonna do well. Looking at tumors or ganglions, looking at the relative vascularity of the nerve, looking at mobility of the nerve, is it increased or decreased? And, and as we learn more and more um, ordinal scales about how much nerves should move or how much excursion they have, um, knowing that this is 
um, can be measured can actually help us determine states of pathology. Some extreme examples of this are um, increased mobility. For example, the owner, or I wouldn't say extreme examples, but some common examples are the owner subluxation or dislocation at the elbow, for example, the increased mobility in some situations might help the nerve and other situations might lead to a neuropathy. Decreased mobility in, a, in an entrapment syndrome like carpal tunnel or a post-operative tarsal tunnel may be a result of um, what we're getting at for the next thing, fibrosis, scarring, and compression. So using all of these parameters are things we should do when we're looking for peripheral nerves and their pathology. Okay, here is just a cartoon view of what happens with the fascicles. This is a coalescence of the fascicles. This is abnormal, and we see this in a partial nerve injury. What tends to happen in really severe injuries then is we just get complete loss of the fascicular pattern when the axons have, have been extremely damaged. And in that case, um, that helps us a little bit determine um, these are more severe injuries. And sometimes we, we can find nerve injuries that are severe in that nature without even identifying an enlargement if we look at the vesicular architecture. For a nerve that's not so severe, you know, one of a number of things present itself. So this is an example of a focal enlargement, sometimes a little easier to, to identify, and it could be a neuropraxic type injury. That you notice that the fascicles are relatively well preserved, but the nerve itself is focally enlarged. Okay, this is in contrast to one with the normal size, but we see some disruption, maybe in a one or two fascicles. There's just a single enlargement that could cause a neuropraxic injury or, or at least a measurable neuropathy. And then we have some that look apparently normal and could fool us, but this may be a diffuse enlargement where we have to do other things like compare other areas of the nerve or maybe even a nerve on the other side to determine if this is even abnormal or not. So those are all ways they can present themselves and fool us a little bit. And, and part of the inspection process. Now with vascular, more and more has been studied on this um, and there's still some limitations about using Doppler flow for um, assessing the health of nerves, just like tendons develop neovascularization if they're chronically entrapped or chronically damaged, nerves can do the same thing. As a general rule with conventional ultrasound machines, if you see um, increased vascularity pulsing within the nerve, that's usually an abnormal thing. And, and some of that will change as we have um, better direction on what we can do with our gain settings for Doppler and, and some of those things. Um, but that's just a general rule. We have to be careful too, that we're actually not seeing pulsations from just perivascular structures that are there normally. An example of that could be a um, persistent median artery for the median nerve. And if you see blood flow there, I've seen people confuse that pulsation with neovascularization. So we have to make sure we've actually studied it and, and, and looked at it enough. And the other thing is make sure we don't have excessive gain and then we're just getting artifact. Okay, so a neuropraxic lesion, often as I mentioned, will usually have preserved fascicles, but they may be certain ones of them may be enlarged. In this case, we've got some enlarged fascicles, um, that, but they're still visible there. And this is an example of one that has a great deal of conduction block, but not a lot of axonal injury um, electrophysiologically. And here's some movement seen back and forth. And we can see there's focal swelling at that level as I go back and forth, but not a lot of fascicular disruption. Okay, so that's, that's an example of a neuropraxic injury. This is one where it has some of the same features as the last one, but this is actually pretty severe axonotmesis. This is an 84 year old man with carpal tunnel advanced to the extent that there was no electrophysiologic function left. And so, so we start looking at this and this is the complete disruption of the internal fascicles, as you can see. So these reflect actual damage to axons and entirely different from what the one we just saw. There may be still some preservation of some fascicles, um, but there's quite a bit of damage. Now, if we follow this and scan it distally, it actually goes into a complete notch, okay, within this flexor did charm superficialis tendons of the index and long finger. So um, that one is one where the, the surgeon couldn't wait to get his hands on him. Okay, so, and then there's neurotmesis that sometimes this is challenging. And I put this one up because um, this is a very obvious one. This is somebody that got their arm caught in an auger and it literally pulled the median nerve to the point that it split off. So this is a complete neurotmesis. It's a long axis view. That's the stump and aroma of the nerve. And this is the nerve here. You'll notice there's still some residual connective tissue that could fool you and 
one that's not quite so severe. So you have to be really careful that you um, pay good attention. You don't want to make a mistake on this one. We can see it in short axis. This is the area where it's enlarged, and this is the last remnant. So, so a lot of this nerve tissue has been pulled proximally. The rest of it's been snapped back distally with the hand. Complete neurotmesis. And here's an example of that same one going back and forth, and, and, and you can tell that it goes to complete zero um, when we go distal enough back and forth in a short axis view. So that one obviously is not going to do anything without surgical intervention. Okay, so some sources of injury and trauma can be from a compression, contusion, a stretch injury, a laceration, burn, or even ischemia. Um, ischemia can happen secondarily to any of these things. So um, these are all things that um, we have to not only pay attention to what um, the nerve looks like, but you know, get a great history of what happened and even have a consideration of the surrounding tissue. Okay, so this is an example that kind of startles people. It, it's not an easy to see slide, um, but this is, this is somebody that actually had foot pain for years and then a surgeon finally decided that he had tarsal tunnel syndrome and had to operate on him. When he operated on him, he had, had a lot of neuritic pain subsequent to that and had sensory loss in the medial plantar distribution. Okay, so what I have here is just a short axis view of the tibial nerve. So an electrodiagnostic study was done on this gentleman and, and it recorded only an abnormality in the medial plantar distribution. And so if you were localizing by electrophysiology, you would say, well, this is probably distal to the tarsal tunnel, but the operation was done at the tarsal tunnel. And what we find is if you look at only the fascicles, there's not a great deal of tibial nerve enlargement here, but there's enlarged fascicles right here at the level of the scar. And you can see that the lateral plantar branch fibers that are right next to it have normal fascicles. The medial plantar branch are enlarged. And this is the opposite side by comparison showing um, that they all should look fairly similar, okay? And this is the same thing in long axis. So really the only abnormality was this fascicular injury right here at the medial plantar branch without a lot of um, nerve swelling, but that resulted in a, a completely dysfunctional, um, nearly dead medial plantar nerve. And, and so we have to really look at that internal architecture here, even if we don't have the ultra high frequency stuff, um, ultrasound. So this is what a neuroma looks like and just kind of a cartoon drawing of it. Here's a real neuroma. So this is one that um, has been damaged and the neuroma by definition is, you can see that loss of this fascicular architecture and that injury. We can work on this very hard to see if there's intervening connective tissue to determine if this is a complete axonotmesis or neurotmesis. We wanna use our electrophysiologic function to do that as well. If we don't find any, then we have to determine, is there still some connective tissue or do we have to intervene immediately? Okay. I, this is where I do a lot of, um, like have people raise hands and things like that. Um, obviously we can't do that in this context in a Zoom, but this one is an example of a complete neurotmesis. Even though it's a neuroma like the last one we saw that actually still had some potential for function, when we see the loss of tension of the nerve, we, we know that it's completely separated and all this is hematoma and junk in the way. There's, there's no viable nerve tissue here. So without some type of intervention, this one will not do well because it doesn't have um, adjoining connective tissue that's maintained any tension on the nerve endings, okay? And remember when we have nerve scars, most of the time the localization's not challenging, but seeing what, you know, if the scar is having an impact on the nerve, if the underlying tendon is having an impact on the nerve, so we wanna make sure that we've scanned all the connective tissue and everything else around it that could also impact and, and propagate a neuropathy. And lacerations will look like heterogeneous scar changes um, around the, um, where we don't see normal tissue. And don't forget that it's always important to look at muscle architecture as well. Um, this is an example of a sternocleidomastoid on a normal side. This is an abnormal side. And this is one obviously that's hyperechoic and atrophied. And so that tells us that's a severe lesion, okay? And, and that's um, not entirely ordinarily measurable, but we know we're in the severe category if we have a muscle and muscle that looks like that. If we have one that looks like this, we know we don't have a great deal of axonal loss. So it's a, it's a helpful parameter to make sure you're always looking at the muscle for these nerves. 
Okay, and we can measure those very accurately as well. Okay, so I thought I'd do a couple cases. Dr. Jim, how long would you like me to go till maybe 945? I don't know if you can talk, Dr. Jim. Uh, you can if you're proceed. muted. You can proceed. Uh, you can talk as much as you want. It's okay. Okay. That's all, that's all right. We'll do a few cases here then. I'll try to go fast so we don't take too much time, but this is this is an example of somebody that had a contusion in their forearm, a 46-year-old, had a weakness of his finger extensors. So an EMG nerve conduction study was done, and it was di diagnosed to be a, um, a posterior osseous syndrome. Okay, and here's the EMG study. There was basically no response to the extensor indices with a recording from that. Had a little... Um, and that is mislabeled, unfortunately. That, so that's the opposite side. That should be the extensor indices also. That's his normal side here. So he had five millivolts on this side and basically nothing on that side. However, the sensories were spared. Okay, so in our scanning process, then we see the radial nerve coming out of the spiral groove. We do side-to-side -side comparisons, they look about the same. The posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm looks pretty good and clinically those were good. We get down to the bifurcation between the deep and superficial branches. Side to side, they look pretty good. And we can see this. And, and if you're not familiar with this, you know, and we're not sure, this is the deep branch of the radial nerve between the two heads of the supinator. If you're familiar with this, you'd say this might look enlarged. If you're not familiar, what I always recommend is compare the other side. And if we compare the other side, this is the asymptomatic side. Um, so we can identify clearly that is abnormal. It's clearly different than the other side. There's some other factors too that the muscle architecture, the overlying extensor digitorum, it's got some denervation. Okay, and this is just mobility of looking at short axis of the unaffected side. So a pretty small set of fascicles going between the two heads of the supinator. This is the affected side. And you can tell that it's pretty enlarged. It's quite a bit different than what we see on the other side. So we definitely see a focal enlargement here. So the next question is, you know, I always say one view is no view. You want to make sure that you have more than one view. Okay. Or, or you may get fooled by what you think you're seeing. So instead of a focal enlargement by this long axis view, we can tell that this thing is extremely diffuse. So it's elongated all the way through the, the radial tunnel instead of just a focal enlargement somewhere. And, and you get that sense of it when you see it in short axis, but this really illuminates how much that is the case. So this isn't gonna respond very easily, just a simple injection in a single spot like the arcade or froze, or, or even a surgical decompression. We have to make sure that we, we understand that the injury to the nerve is over a longer area. So it's still a focal injury, but it's not hyperfocal. It's over a pretty large area of, of a couple centimeters. So it help, helps to define that, okay? Um, so another case. So this is a 22-year-old college football player with um, acute knee dislocation. He was an NFL prospect. Um, afterwards, he has foot drop. And so when we, what, an electrophysiology study was done and there was no function of the fibular nerve and the tibial nerve was normal. Okay, so the question is, you know, you know, a lot of things come to mind. Is there still some continuity in this nerve? Is there something propagating or, or still compressing? Is there a hematoma, bone fragment, some other tissue, some other injury um, that could be making this worse? Okay, so here we scan the popliteal fossa. So this is the lateral femoral condyle and articular cartilage popliteal artery. Here's the tibial nerve and there's the fibular nerve. And I usually ask people, okay, um, does this look normal or abnormal? And the answer is abnormal. And you can tell that immediately because the fibular nerve is usually about one third the size of the tibial nerve in this context. But we can look at a few other things in here too. We have the gastroc muscles. They don't look denervated. We have the short head of the biceps femoris right here. That doesn't look denervated. So just in a quick view, we can get a lot of information here, and, and we know that that is abnormal at that point. This muscle architecture, everything neighboring it is okay. We don't see an effusion. We don't see a hematoma. Okay, now this is long axis. Okay, again, we see the lateral gastrocnemius here, which is normal. 
And then, and if you're not used to looking this, I, I will ask people, is this normal or abnormal? And if you're not sure, because we don't see a focal enlargement anywhere, we can go to the opposite side and say, you oh, know, that's clearly abnormal. It's, it's about three times the diameter of the normal side at that level of depth. Okay, so, so this is, as we would guess, it's a result of a stretch injury. So there's not, a, unlike the last case we saw, it's not really a focal injury. It's a pretty diffuse stretch injury. And we look some more here and um, we can tell that the architecture is preserved. So the question is surgical intervention. And most people say, well, we wait a little while and see if there's any potential recovery. And you could also intervene non-surgically, like with injection therapy too, to try to help them out. Um, but, it, but understanding that we know it's not a complete neurotmesis, it's a complete axonotmesis. We say complete because there's no electrophysiological or, or clinical function within that nerve but we see that there, it is in continuity from a diffuse stretch, okay? So that's what we concluded. Here's the next case. It's almost identical. It's a 22-year-old NFL prospect, defensive end, collegiate football player who dislocated his knee. He even told me he saw his foot in the pile right next to him. Okay, so we look at the common fibular nerve. We'll kind of do the same thing. And we're going to look back and forth here. And that doesn't look too normal there. I'm even throwing Doppler to see, on there to see if uh, – there's injury to the nerve. This is the fibular nerve and we don't see much fascicular architecture. That's the um, lateral serocutaneous nerve right next to it. So that branch comes off the fibular nerve. That actually seems to have some fascicles to it. Okay, so there again, we know it's much bigger than our tibial nerve, which it should not be. We don't see a whole lot of architecture. And, and this is what we look at. So this is, a, this is a case where I try to fool people and say, do you wanna go right to surgery on this one? Some people do just because they're concerned about the way this looks and there's so much in an neural demon, loss of physical architecture that they figure that functionally ought to have some kind of surgical repair. But the answer is we need to know more information. This is long axis. This is short axis. That certainly doesn't look very good. But this is where we have a neuroma that has, if we go more distal, we see this wavy pattern that we talked about. It means the nerve's no longer on, under tension. And the fibular nerve usually is adhesed by the fibular tunnel and fibular head. And so that's often where the worst injury will be in a stretch injury of this nature. So we have to really inspect that well. And so if we go back and look and take only this information, we don't see here, this has no chance to get better. So this looked clinically and electrophysiologically exactly like the last case. However, it's entirely different because it's a complete neurotmesis. And we couldn't have told that without, without the imaging. So another case, this is a nine-year-old self-inflicted knife wound behind the knee, he did it accidentally. Um, and you've seen two weeks after the injury and a repair of a smart ulterior bleed had foot drop and no movement was seen at all. But he said he could feel everything. He had no sensory complaints and we're all scratching our heads. We know where the injury was. He stabbed himself right behind the hamstring tendon and in the popliteal fossa. And, and like, so how could his sensation be intact? It's curious, right? So you think, well, it's an incomplete or is it complete or, you know, we don't want to mess this up. They didn't really want to do any electrophysiology study on him and they felt it was kind of early anyway. He was actually 10 days out, I believe, instead of two weeks. And so we see this at the injury site. This is the fibular nerve. You think, okay, that doesn't look very good. It looks like it's split right down the middle here. And they had, they had tried an MRI on him and that's kind of what the radiologist felt as it was just cut right down the middle. Here's the scar that gets deep into the lateral gastrocnemius. So there's clearly a lateral gastrocnemius injury. We always want to be careful that we don't try to overdiagnose anything from a still picture. Okay. So in reality, as we look at it, this is the lateral branch of the sural nerve, and this is the fibular nerve, and it really didn't split the nerve, and I'll show you. So here, here we look at this and we go back and forth. And this, this branch had already branched off. And the, and the knife wound actually went right in between these two branches. Okay, so it, it, real, it certainly injured it, um, but there was some sparing. And this is, again, the lateral gastrocnemius is a short axis view. I'll take a couple images of this. Okay, and this is just a little bit higher up. Okay, so this is after the bifurcation from the sciatic nerve. And you can see there's enlarged fascicles there. And you notice they're more enlarged the leading portion of the fibular nerve that's moving towards the fibular head looks worse than the trailing portion. 
And, and we all know that sometimes we can be fooled electrophysiologically about nerve injuries because sometimes the fast, if we have selective fascicle injury, it may look like it's at, from a different location. So he, he seemed to have purely just a, a, a deep branch injury, um, but at the same time he had some weakness of his um, ankle eversion too. It made it confusing, but no sensory loss. Okay, and there we go back through it again. You see the knife wound is right at the level where the branch of the lateral branch of the sural nerve was, or the lateral sericutaneous. And my phone is talking to me. So here's the um, lateral gastrocnemius injury. So it's also important to look at. Stop, Siri. Okay, so this is a long axis of the fibular nerve. Siri was telling us what the what the gastrocnemius was. But here's the fibular nerve, and um, so our, our our assignment here now is to determine: Is this nerve actually in continuity? At the, at, are these fibers? Or is this something that really needs a repair right away? So we look at it, look at it, and there's the nerve, and there's definitely some fascicles as I put tension on it, and you don't want to put too much tension on a wound like this, but as you put tension on it, you can still see there's still fascicles keeping that nerve together. This has a chance to heal, and that was what we concluded. Okay, so why the clinical profile then, you asked too. What, isn't it strange that it was so strongly motor so if we look at it, now this is the fibular head off to the right of the screen. This is the um, lateral serocutaneous nerve that goes away relatively unscathed. Some of these fascicles are a little big. And if you look here, these look pretty bad. These don't look quite as bad, but mildly bad. So you have to believe me that what he did with his injury is this is the deep branch of the fibular nerve fascicles and they're really injured. This is the superficial motor branch, and these are the sensory branches of superficial fibular. These are the least affected, and in that order, and that's exactly how he clinically presented. And, and so I, I put a little slide in there just showing some of that representation of these nerves. So generally the deep fascicles, the deep, and we, we find this, there may be some variation, but not a lot. Most of the time the deep fibular fascicles run um, into the fibular tunnel first. So even though it's all under one epineurium, these are all separated and you can see them individually. And this isn't the same case actually, I just put this for the clarity of the labels, okay? So learning all these, these fascicle architectures can really help us with these complex injuries. And those of you see a lot of you know, fibular neuropathies, I'm sure you've run into cases where it just seemed to affect certain fibers more than the others. And that's because they're actually quite split apart even before they go into the tunnel. So it's critical information to know. So Dr. Jim, you keep going or a good place to stop? Going, Dr. Jeff. Just keep going. Keep going? So, yes. You know, you guys aren't sick of me yet? Okay. Yeah, it's all right. Okay. I'll do whatever. I could talk all night, but well, I'll try to I'll try to wrap it up. But when it's post-surgical, one thing that we want to do is we make sure we assess for anatomic alteration, scarring, other compression, but always get a detailed history of the complaint. So post-surgical can, can be trauma too. That's why I put that in there. So those of you, for example, that get a post-operative carpal tunnel, well, just even something simple like that. The history usually tells us what went wrong. So if they come in and say, I'm much worse, as soon as I woke up from the anesthesia, I got sensory loss and things I didn't have. So then we think, what? It's probably a surgical complication, right? Okay, what happens if they tell us that it got quite a bit better for a while and then gradually gets worse? It's probably post-operative scarring, okay? Or some other factor that's making it gradually worse. And what if it didn't have any effect whatsoever? That means either probably one of two things, either a diagnosis was wrong entirely or our intervention was ineffective for some other reason, okay? And many times with carpal tunnel, it's because we didn't um, go down to the distal retinaculum far enough, okay? I'm gonna skip this one. But this is just, actually, this is just a case, I'll, I'll do it quickly, where this is actually, this is an early bifurcation or bifid median nerve and, it, and after the surgery, the individual only had numbness in the radial aspect of the ring finger and the owner aspect of the lung finger. And they didn't have numbness, they had complete sensory loss. Okay, where actually the other fingers seemed to get better. 
And, and so that would lead you to believe that it got the common palmar branch of the third web space and that the injury is in the palm when instead, actually, they did a tenosynovectomy and the injury is up in the distal forearm. And we can see that um, by looking at these fascicles and we realize right here, because it had an early bifurcation, only this area, this is the persistent median artery. So this is the more radial aspect of the fascicles of the median nerve. And right here, we have a complete loss of these fascicles. And that was from the surgical procedure. And then it gets back to normal. So it does, does get enlarged at that point, point as well. But th that fascicular injury is there. And, and by distinguishing that with ultrasound, that puts the location of the injury in a different place than we expected. And certainly our treatment, if we were in the wrong place, wouldn't be effective. So we knew right where to uh, decompress this area. Okay. Long axis. Here is just a, another thing that can help you sometimes in things you can't necessarily identify electrophysiologically. We know this is, this is actually the uh, son of a very prominent electro, nationally known electrophysiologist in the United States. And he was having a Bromstone procedure and one of the residents actually accidentally bovied him and stuck the bovie on there and held it there. And, and so he had this burn injury and he had this sensory deficit right here. And they're like, well, what is that? And that's what that is. It's a distal end of the saphenous nerve. This is a secondary thing, not related. And, and so with ultra high frequency, we can actually see, find the saphenous nerve relatively well. It's a short axis view of it. And so this is an example of a burn injury. This is above the wound. This is the greater saphenous vein. We can identify that and the nerve is here. Okay, and that, now we get to still above the wound. Now we're over the wound. And notice how we go from this, this level of um, cross-sectional area to this. Okay, and for perspective, this is seven millimeters across the entire screen. So the entire um, height of this is less than two millimeters. Okay, but it's enlarged and we can see the fascicles in here. So this is at 70 megahertz. And this is the cone of burn right here. So they literally stuck it right on uh, over the distal end of the saphenous nerve. So again, this is a, a really fine thing, but if we're gonna do something maybe non-surgical and do a, and plan an intervention, we can define this neuropathy and what's happened in some detail and then and try to do something that's therapeutic for this okay and this is just a um showing it go back and forth here the dynamic and again and you can see that focal enlargement right there in the area of the burn and and kind of identify also if there's anything persistent or any scarring or anything that we have to deal with okay and this one i'm proud of actually this is a long axis view of that distal saphenous nerve. This is about two tenths of a millimeter in diameter. We can see it and we can see the burn injury of it. So another example, the same thing. A couple of last things, late complications are gonna happen after trauma. I'm gonna skip this one, it's long, but needless to say, that's a post-operative scarring for a tarsal tunnel release. That one gets very long though. And that one gets long too. So we'll do one quickie and then we'll do questions. So, and this is a quickie, but this is a persistent pain in the first web space, numbness after an ankle open reduction internal fixation. And so we think, okay, it's probably at least the um, medial branch of the deep fibular nerve. We can assess the um, sensor digitorum brevis to determine if the lateral branch is also affected, okay? And here's the deep fibular nerve. Extensor digitorum brevis doesn't look denervated. Superficial fibular nerve is up above it. So let's see what's going on to cause this persistent numbness. And the answer is there's a screw after the open reduction internal fixation that's causing this neuropathy right here. So we can see that in, in great detail and see the focal enlargement and see here's the um, video loop. And it's also got the um, dorsalis pedis, which is also irritating there. So we can, and so if something happens quite quite a bit after a, a surgery, then we think, all right, something is mechanically changed to cause that potential, and that's what we have to investigate. Okay. So summary: optimize your image when you're dealing with these kinds of things. Always scan sufficiently to see the entire picture. Always scan with more than one view. Use muscle architecture that helps us, and always have a comprehensive differential diagnosis before we go in. 
and believe in yourself even when no one else will. Thank you. You can unmute everybody, I guess. Right now I'm the host, though. Do I have to do it? Yeah, yeah. Just uh, change the host. Yes. Okay, thank you. Dr. Change the host Dr. back Jeff. to you. Maybe you can do it better. Yeah, I will just reclaim it. Okay, that's okay. Uh, I already reclaim it. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jeff. That was a very comprehensive lecture. It was really nice. So you. do you have do you have any question, uh, Dr. Jeff? Let me give the first question. Uh, what's the? Of course, you're, you're using a Vivo, so we don't have that uh, luxury of that kind of machine. But w would you would you uh, tell us? Uh, how, how, much, how much frequency do we need to be able to see that kind of detail? Well, it, it's kind of a, the higher frequency for very superficial structures, the more detail that you see. It's a great question. What I found is though, virtually everything I can see on the Vivo, I can go back to the conventional ultrasound and see it also, <laughs> okay? Okay. But sometimes, so what, by using the Vivo, I think it's more just ingrained me to look for some of these things that maybe I wasn't looking for before. And, and it kind of tunes you in, but, but some of these conventional instruments and they keep getting better and better. You don't, you don't need necessarily that level of detail all the time. Sometimes it's maybe more than you need. Um, but, but for teaching purposes, it kind of clues you in on things that you can look for. So I can like, like, you saw that fibular nerve. You can see all that detail in all those different fascicles once you learn to start looking for them. And because they're they're the same in most people and they have the same pattern. So, yeah. And another question, Dr. Jeff, is uh, I was trying to review the papers and I've noticed that uh, in all the papers that is available, it only says that you can distinguish between neuropraxia and axonot meses, but you cannot really see the neurot meses. But right now you have shown us that even the neurot meses, you can also see it. Correct. So uh, uh, did you publish the paper already? I'm working on a book right now, sir. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, we're dealing with this long cold disasters too right now. But um, yeah, I, I need to publish more, you're right. Yeah, because uh, you're. I, I'll be honest. I'm putting a lot yeah. of the, I'm putting some of these things in the book that haven't been yes. published, and they're just our experience. It's not in the so paper yet. The paper is much more important because it's been peer reviewed. So, but I'm 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 putting a lot of these concepts in the book, and people can try them for themselves too. So. Doctor Jeff. Okay. Doctor Jeff, can yes, I yes. Uh, ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, uh, hi, I'm Ravi. Thanks for the great lecture. See, um, you were mentioning about the surrounding structures yes, and sir. muscle was very, very prominent in most of the description of the morphology that you have just mentioned. At no point of time uh, was there any mention of any kind of fascia, fashion related um, uh, differences in density of the fascia say for example it's very very relative and uh, very observer specific but fascia and um, I, I'm a pain medicine uh, specialist so I'm so um, um, kind of obsessed with, with the fascia and the fascial density whenever somebody complains of pain and when I see a neuroma there so uh, how important is it to pick up the fascia, um, fascial density or, um, in relation to the neuromas? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. And, and that is an area which is starting to, to blossom a little bit. Um, Brad Fullerton in um, Austin, Texas is doing a lot of work with that. Um, and, and some of the guys I worked with, you know, I, I went to the uh, um, regenerative medicine group in denver this year and that was a very important thing and we talked quite a bit about it but there's not a lot published yet in terms of okay. direction um but but i think you're very very you're right on the money you're exactly right i think that's a big part especially with these chronic pain problems maybe maybe a little less with trauma where they're they're more you know that like you mentioned that the, 
the surrounding tissue is much more obvious in a traumatic situation, which is what we're pretty much presenting here. Um, but, but I think, you know, fascial changes, fascial thickening, things like that that are asymmetric can have, you know, chronic effects on nerves over time. So we just, we need to get better at that. And that's, that's a work in progress for a lot of people. But very good. Thank very you. Good point. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kassler, uh, may I ask some questions, please? Yeah, sure, sure. That's uh, Desi. Okay, go ahead, Desi. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kassler, I received from Indonesia. Dr. Dave. Yeah. I'm Desi, I'm a neurologist. Thank you so much for the very great lecture. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Uh, we are doing uh, a research, sir. It is ongoing. So far, so it is about the neuropathy. The neuropathy are caused by the post cardiac uh, catheterization procedure. As we know, some of our patients. Uh, numbness or just a uh, very slight slight problem and that is can uh, normal uh, in two two three months after procedure. Now, we are in uh, the research is ongoing now. What uh, I, I I want to ask you uh, for the ultrasound planning, we have a plan to also do some research for that. For the risk of the for the neuropathy that we assume or our hypothesis is about how close the radial artery to the radial nerve, and then how big the the lumen of the radial artery. Do you think that we can see the abnormal nerve of the radial nerve by the ultrasound uh, for this uh, research? Because you know the maybe the lesion is not so severe. And it can solve uh, automatically after two, three months. Maybe the problem is just neuropraxia. What do you think? Uh, do, do do we? Is there any other uh, risk factor that we? I I heard only pieces of that. There was so much. We can find from the ultrasound finding. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. I got a lot of feedback and I, I lost a lot of that question. I, I think you, you're doing a project where you're looking at the, is it the superficial radial sensory nerve and the radial artery? We get, a lot of, we get a lot of noise in that question. Dr. Des, if you have another device, please mute your other device. Radial artery that, that, that is so close to the nerve, uh, radial nerve, so that can make to the... Do you mean at the wrist where it's close? Are you talking about at the wrist? Or forearm? Or are you talking about up at the arm? Uh, sorry. Okay. Maybe it is from my, my, my office. Close, leave. Yes, I live on the one of my device. Dr. Jim, I, she's. Let's not have yeah, uh, Desi, is, is uh, Desi can, can you can you? Yeah, can you mute the your other the device? Do you have Do you have yes. any device with you? So uh, some okay. of our patients got their own. Yes, done. Okay, Desi, uh, can, can you mute your other device if it is with you? So, because we don't get the questions very clearly. 
Uh, it, it only comes in pieces. Uh, I, I I cannot understand the question. Also, so can can you mute other devices with you so we can hear the exact questions that you are trying to ask? I I have left the meeting for other devices. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I'm so sorry. I have yeah. left one of my other devices. And question, may I? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Oh, okay. My question is about uh, one of our research. Uh, we are doing a research about the neuropathy because we know that some of our patients got neuropathy post-cardiac catheterization procedure. Post-cardiac? Cardiac catheterization. Ra radial approach to the, to the ca right. cardiac okay. catheterization. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Radial approach. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Radial approach of cardiac catheterization. And we found some patients got neuropathy or the radial nerve. You mean the sensory to rest? Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. And we want okay. to know what is the risk of the neuropathy because not all of the patients got neuropathy past, past that procedure, right? Okay. So we have, we have a hypothesis that uh, the anatomy of the artery is about location or about the size of the lumen of radial, uh, radial okay. artery is one of the risk factor. So that's why we want to see how close the radial nerve to the radial artery. The closer the radial nerve to the artery, the, uh, the bigger of the risk for the neuropathy post procedure. And then the lumen of the radial artery. We know that we put uh, some size of catheter inside the radial artery. So if the radial artery is small, but we put the big catheter, it can make uh, the problem for the radial artery and can put it uh, bigger, the size is bigger, and it can compress the radial nerve uh, for 15 minutes, we think that it can cause the neuropathy procedure. So, uh, do you know? Do you, do you think that we have other risks for that? We can find other risks by the ultrasound finding. So, for sure. the ultrasound, we will see oh, the yeah oh, the yeah. location and the lumen. And do you think any other risks that we can find for the ultrasound finding for this research? One, one thing is there's a lot of variation how how close the the superficial radial nerve will hug the radial artery. It's, it's different in different individuals. And, and that's one thing. The other, the other is, um, if you even, it gets really complicated, but if you get, if they have a more hypertrophied brachioradialis, it tends to fixate. If you've heard of, you know, Wartenberg syndrome, where that nerve gets tethered a little bit, if it's, if it's a little less mobile at that point, yeah. it tends to <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 yeah. being pierced or being injured. Where some some people's radial nerves will just roll out of the way, you put pressure on them. Some people's don't as much. So, so part of that I think is you know I think you can study in the, in that population is is do a vascular study to look at the lumen of the radial artery and look if there's any aberrant branches. Look at their muscle architect or their their muscle a little bit and and look at the the. The exit point of the superficial radial sensory nerve when it becomes volar and subcutaneous, and how mobile is it? Is it something that can be just rolled out of the way, or is it something that's relatively fixed? And, and some people, they, those sit really close to each other, and some people, it tends to not be as close to the, the artery at all. And, and if that's a consistent problem, you could scan them in advance and try to figure that out, too. So I hope that answered your question. Okay. Prof Professor, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, Professor, can I can I ask you another question, um, Dr. Ravi? Um, is it Ravi? Is it Ravi? 
Yeah, Ravi. Yeah. Okay. Hey, okay. Uh, Go ahead, Ravi. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, um, see, in terms of ultrasound, uh, is it possible possible to pick up the primary problem, meaning um, nerve leading to a muscle injury or a fascial injury, fascial uh, in injury, or is it the uh, could you find out with the morphology if it's the other way around? <laughs> I don't know if I was, um, I was audible there. I don't know. Were you able to? And I'm not sure I understood the question. There was a lot of noise too during. That. I'm really um, sorry. Can I repeat the question, uh, Professor? I, I think I think your question was: Is there a way to use ultrasound to distinguish? Is it primary nerve problem or is it the yeah. the muscle or fascia causing the problem? Yes, 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 yes. That was my question. Yeah, yes, I correct. think so. And I think there's lots of examples of that. Um, and, and, and sometimes it propagates, right? So if, if we get yeah. a nerve enlargement somewhere, then, then a, a muscle region or fascial region that normally wouldn't affect it so much um, tend, tends to continue. So, um, you know, we, we have our common entrapments where we kind of know the, the, the musculoskeletal basis for them, like carpal tunnel syndrome and, yeah. and to some extent ulnar and, you know, some of these other areas where people get, you know, even for example, the, the tunnel syndrome in the supinator is, is a bit controversial. Tarsal tunnel is a bit controversial. Thoracic outlet is controversial. And, and the reasons those are all controversial is people really can't come to consensus of, you know, what caused some of them. And, okay. and, and it gets complicated. And so, so the answer is what you do the best you can with, discovering what's a, a musculoskeletal predisposition for the nerve. And, and maybe that predisposition is worsened by the fact that the nerve got affected to begin with. You know, if, if they started with a contusion and then it, then it, it got worse over time. And, and so we're just learning those things. Um, but, you know, we, we're still trying to all get better at it. So. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, how would the uh, nutrition on the rapid look like under USG or the ultra high frequency USG? How would it what? I'm sorry? Uh, nutritional neuropathy. Nutritional? Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's a wide array of potential problems. So um, a nutritional neuropathy may, may or may not have enlargement. And the things you would see in that situation would be very nonspecific for the most part. You wouldn't necessarily see focal changes anywhere um, unless, again, if you have a metabolically challenged nerve, the nerves can get affected in places where they get trapped more potentially too. So, um, and, and so what your role would be in, in trying to identify that is, is look at general enlargement versus the general population. And there might be some. You wouldn't generally see a lot of fascicular changes. You would instead see um, some enlargement, but that's a very nonspecific um, finding that hasn't been terribly studied. So there, there've been a few papers on it, but, um, that's something we need more work too, I guess. But, but I don't, I don't know that we have, you know, even with ultra high frequency, um, we, we can see some structural changes sometimes, um, but I don't think it would distinguish nutritional versus other generalized things. And, and part of that would depend on everything's a spectrum, right? So that the more severe the neuropathy would be, the more likely we would be to see some of those changes, but that would still be fairly nonspecific. All right, great answers. Because uh, we're trying to compare between the one that uh, is treated and not treated and see how uh, USC might help us in uh, identifying which structure is repaired, which structure is not repaired. Okay, thank you so much. Bye bye. Yeah, I, I, that, that would be, that's a, a great research area. So um, I'd like to see where that. that comes along. <laughs> so. uh, prognostications, um, is that actually, um, uh, prognostication by ultrasound seems to mm -hmm. be a more, uh, um, more uh, definitely um, a reliable tool versus um, other uh, parameters. Is that correct way of thinking or am I imagining or being stupid? You're not being stupid, but I, I didn't quite understand it. It's prognostication um, yeah, with uh, ultrasound is, is 
Yeah, users uh, say in, uh, for example, if I am dealing with some fascial uh, thickening, I come back to okay. the same fascia because I'm always intrigued by this. Um, yeah. I'm trying to release with whatever uh, possible interventions is that I can do. And uh, I go back again for about two months later, I come back and see the same fascia. It's more thicker, less dense. So I trying to... I'm trying to prognosticate through the ultrasound. Is that a fair thing to do or right. stupid? So, so ner nerves, that's a complicated question. Okay. And a complicated challenge to figure out. Um, nerves, electrophysiologically, we get, you know, what we determine prognostically, where we consider that in the electrophysiology realm is something that's got a lot of axonal loss does worse than something that's got less axonal loss and is more neuropraxic. So when we're talking about nerve prognostication, that's what we're talking about. We have some clues like that with ultrasound when they talk about muscle architecture and what does the internal fascicular aspect look like in those nerves. In term, but there's another way to think of pro prognostication, kind of in the sense that I think you are. If, if we don't alleviate some of these mechanical factors that are damaging the nerves, then we can prognostically say they're not going to do well. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a real thing. I mean, yeah. you know, a post-surgical carpal tunnel, we'll just take a common example that more people are used to. If, if, if that nerve is scarred um, and it's tethered and every time you move your fingers, it's, it's, it's being tethered against that overlying scar, you can in a sense prognosticate that it's not gonna do well without an intervention. It can't possibly because it's being completely stressed every time somebody moves their hand and, and it's gonna propagate. So I can see those people and say pretty confidently um, they're not going to do well as opposed to somebody where they still have some pretty good dynamic movement. Okay. And, and certainly it's a little more challenging than something that if you're doing small, you know, say you're doing the dorsal scapular nerve or something yeah. like that and trying to um, decide prognostically, how's that doing based on fascial thickness, that's going to take more work before we can say that. But certainly that same concept is there. If there's a structural thing that's leading to it, not doing well, if we don't alleviate that, you know, prognostically it's not going to do as well and that that's kind of what we mean by prognosis it's slightly different than how severe the nerve is but we can project that it's not going to do well without an intervention if if we can really establish there's still focal enlargement and there's notching on the nerve and and the fascia is affecting yeah. the nerve. Yeah. thank you mm -hmm. uh, dr jeff excuse me for, for some of us who don't, you know, uh, who are still beginning to learn this, uh, how do you actually measure a bifurcated nerve? Can you just give us a... a bifid nerve? Bi bifurcated? You mentioned something about bifurcated nerve. Yeah, so you mean like in the, the median nerve in the carpal tunnel? Yes. Gosh, that kind of thing? Yes. Yeah, so good question. And, and so that was an important thing too. I, can you still see my screen? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, um, I have one right up here somewhere where we're just seeing two fascicles. It's not, it's not a classic bifid, but, um, and, and that's very important. You know, I don't know where it is. That's, but anyway, so, so what we're doing is we're comparing, it's just like comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges, right? That's what we want to do when we measure. So what we, we're really measuring is sort of the volume of nerve fascicles, right? What's inside the epineurium. So I'll just make a picture. So if the median nerve is like this and it's all, all within one epineurium, more proximally in the forearm, we would measure inside that epineurium. When it branches, and, and what a bifid means is just it's branching earlier than it normally does. We, and, and so for example, a lot of times what that bifid is, it's the common palmar branch of the third web space comes off early. That's what it is in most people. So now you have connective tissue and things in between those fascicles, and you don't want to measure the whole thing because it's not going to be accurate. You're not measuring the same stuff. And so what you want to measure then when it's a bifid is you, you measure inside the epineurium in one, measure inside the epineurium in the other, and you add them together. And, and that's, that's how you do it. And so if, if I had a nerve that was a bifid, you know, in the forearm and it measured eight millimeters squared, 
right? And then they came apart and this one was five and this one was four. You combine them, it's nine millimeters squared. That'd still be normal. That's just, so there's no enlargement. But if this is six and this is six, that's 12, that would be abnormal. That means we've got enlargement. And, and the same trick on when we do these bifids um, that people have to pay attention to too, when we look at them again in long axis, we have to make sure we look at both segments if we're doing something like a carpal tunnel, any kind of tunnel entrapment in, in that circumstance. Okay, thank you so Pro much. Pro yeah. Professor, a, a small little question on, uh, on uh, the course of the nerve that you actually tracked it down. Um, mm -hmm. can, so I was wondering if this tracking is more proximal. Yeah, uh, usually distal tracking is fine. But do you also do the proximal tracking all the way, maybe sometimes like say you mentioned dorsal scapular, do you go all the way to the foramen or whatever? Sure, um, yeah, so I do. And so when I, um, what I decide I'm gonna do when I scan is an extension of my history and physical and what I need to rule out, okay? If I, if I uh, have any, for, we'll just take a simpler example like the ulnar nerve. You know, it's pretty easy to scan the entire thing, even all the way up to the plexus. Okay. And, and there's actually not a great reason not to. Um, okay. It doesn't mean you have to do calculations at every level, but you can just, you know, when, when you're short access to something, you can move right along. And that's the beauty of ultrasound over MRI okay. is you don't have any, any separate cuts and you can see the entire yeah. thing continually okay. in, in one continuous loop. So, um, so I will try to see the whole thing when there's something pathologic that I want to scan. If I know it's the injuries at the wrist and I won't necessarily do that then. If I'm looking at the dorsal scapula, though, I'm going to look at it everywhere I can if I'm worried there's an injury there. And, and most certainly want to see it, you know, so you can see clearly coming off the C5 root. Um, yeah. and you can see branches. And if it has secondary branches, look and see if it's got an anatomic variation that might impact on, on the result of it clinically. So you might even have one, one part of it injured and the other part not. You know, those are things. And then looking at the surrounding structure, what's the middle scaling look like and, you know, all those things. What's the yeah. end muscle look like? Dorsal scapular and um, pattern. So, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Stanley, go ahead. Yes. Stanley, Stanley, you have a question? Yes. Um, in, in fact, okay. I just want to um, um, echo uh, Professor Jeff's um, comment about the, especially talking about um, how to use uh, ultrasound. Uh, to make um, diagnosis uh, like a nerve or, or fascia or uh, make a prognostic factors and then um, for the answer of um, Ravi. In fact, uh, ultrasound has the beauty of uh, making, a, making it dynamic. We cannot move that much under any other type of investigations. But ultrasound, you can ask the patient to move and then you can also yeah. move the patient. You can also yeah. scan dynamically by pressing down and then onto that, that uh, structures you're, 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 you're looking at. And the ultrasound, you also have uh, two sides of the body. You know, the gods provide us with uh, both sides. And then that have to be, those have to be, you know, symmetrical. Uh, okay. For example, when you're talking about uh, like uh, the dorsal scapular nerve, which is usually, you know, trapped, uh, underneath the um, levator scapulae, and then really outside the serratus posterior superior. And then that nerve entrapment over there, you can just basically comparing the uh, serratus posterior superior on both sides, and also the levator scapulae on both sides, and then scanning the two nerves on the both sides, and then comparing it. And then that's, you, you're talking about the fascia within those muscles, you know, outside, and also in, interlinking those muscles together. And that's, that's one way to do that. And of course you can use ultrasound to press on the, the structures you're looking at. And then um, uh, Professor Jeff is making a very good example of you know, the seeing the median nerve being trapped by the, you know, the flexor tendons, especially the tendon sheath. If they have a, you know, like a, talking, talking about like the manual workers we're looking at, those patients are usually presenting with like a, degenerative overuse type of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. When they're using, you know, the drill, the drill for the, for the, uh, for the uh, construction, and then they have a lot of vibrations over the, the carpal tunnel. And then 
apart from you know digital radio owner join the scaffold luna join luna triquedro join they they are very lax at the same time they develop tendinopathy tendinosis over those uh, flexor tendons especially the superficialis and then those tendons when they having a lot of a scar tissue they will have tether to the to the median nerve and they're causing the the true carpal tunnel type, type of syndrome so you can use ultrasound, you can use dynamic movement, asking the patient to make a fist yeah. and trying to see whether the, the nerve is being trapped or tethered, you know, uh, during the movement of the fingers and then um, to the median nerve. So that's one way to, 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 to look at that. Another beauty of yeah. ultrasound is um, ultrasound has power Doppler or color Doppler. You can, you, you can see the color, color Doppler and the power Doppler and then around the nerve as uh, Professor Jeff has pointed out to him, in his uh, excellent uh, lecture. By the way, Jeff, very good, very good lecture. This is a great, that, that is the, the, one of the best nerve talk I've, I've ever listened. Oh, wow, thank you. That, that means a lot. So, and then, so, so that's one. So congratulations. And then, so that's, I, I, think the, I think the audience here is, they are very, leg, you know, they're luxury. It's, <laughs> they're very, <Yeah. laughs> it's a luxury for, for, for all of us, you know, sitting in the, in the office and then sitting at home and then can listen to such a great lectures. So it's wow. such a very, it's, it's, a, it's such a beauty. Okay. And so I think like power Doppler and then also the color Doppler can help a bit on, uh, as, as pointed out by Professor Jeff. So just that's, um, I think that the comparison dynamic power Doppler, and then also there's one way we can do as uh, interventional um, physicians, and they can do a little bit of hydro dissections uh, yeah. around that nerve. I, you know, my advice is not to put lidocaine in, into your solution just by using 5% dextrose around the nerve. If you can make the nerve better, apart from the, pathophy, apart from the electrical physiological point of view, if the 5% dextrose can eliminate patient's neuropathic pain, that means this nerve is, you, you know, can survive. If that cannot do any good to the to the patient, I don't believe that's um, that's that's a, you know a, apart from the electrical physiological um, support. I think this is also another you know diagnostic part of um, giving you some clue to that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for the thank you. Comments. Thank you. Great comment. I I agree with every bit of that and. Uh, one, one thing that Professor Lamb just pointed out is that I've been trying to get across is just the, the capabilities of this um, modality is so much greater than just circling nerves and seeing if they're enlarged or not. And if there's one take home point for tonight, <laughs> I think that's it. And he just pointed out a, a lot of those features. Dr. Jeff, uh, before you finally go, I just mm -hmm. want to uh, congratulate you for a very outstanding lecture. Let's give a big hand to Dr. Jeff. Thank you very much, Dr. Jeff, for such a beautiful, outstanding lecture. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Yeah, but Thank before I let, I let you go, I would like to ask one more question, if that's sure. okay with you. Uh, my question is... Uh, you got one question, though. Can, oh, never mind. I, I figured it out. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to, how to see everybody, and I, 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 I killed it. Oh, oh, no, you, I, oh okay. you want you want to see everybody now? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wiped you guys off the screen. I okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm Can sorry, Dr. Jim. <laughs> okay. Okay. My my only question is, uh, I was trying to look at the papers regarding the earliest time you can see any changes in uh, the nerve when there is a pathology, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I've seen mixed uh, uh, information about, uh, of course, EMG can see as early as three weeks or sometimes two weeks, right? Uh, and sometimes three days, depends on that. So it's going to be the same answer for, you can, number one, you can see th changes with ultrasound and, and anatomically faster than you can see all of the changes in electrophysiology. Okay, so, so for example, you can see some things in electrophysiology immediately, right? So recruitment changes right. immediately. What you don't see is changes related to wall-iron degeneration. 
Okay, right. so that's why that's why if you're using prognostication and and looking at the distal sensory nerve action potentials and the distal compound muscle action potentials and fibrillations that may not happen yet because the cell membranes of the muscle cells haven't degenerated yet. If you, as long as you know those things, you can still gain information immediately with EMG. We do that all the time in trauma, um, but ultrasound is even quicker. So, so the answer to your question is, it's it's you know there's there's no paper on this because you'd have to qualify the type of trauma it was. Yeah, and, and if there's a very severe trauma, you're going to see things immediately, right? And then right. And, there's, and and if it's a mild, and the same thing with electrophysiology, if it's a if if you're just worried about say a radiculopathy that's painful in, with EMG and there's no real axonal injury, your, your most sensitive feature is going to be fibrillations, which you may not see for three weeks, as you mentioned, right. you know, because that's, that's where you'd want to wait for something small. But if you have a catastrophic injury, you, you can look right away. You can look right away and see, is there a, a neurotmesis? Is there a big hematoma that's going to affect this right away that we need to intervene on? All those kinds of things. So, so the clinical decision about when to do it is based on what information do you need right now. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. So, th thank you very much, Dr. Jeff. And again, uh, hopefully, we can have you again. <laughs> well, that was fun. <laughs> I wish you could be there in person. I yeah. Do, 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 yeah. Do you, do you want Dr. Jeff to? Uh, to 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 come again? Of course, Don't yeah. Me. You'll, you'll hurt my feelings. <laughs> okay, you hurt my feelings. Okay. You can't so, if you don't want me to. <laughs> yeah, uh, we we want you to be back. Uh, we want you to uh, have another one if it's okay with you. Oh, sure. uh, Any time soon. So thank you very much again, Dr. Jeff, and uh, we're looking forward to your new book on herbs. I'm working that, very uh, hard to get it done. That's of all I've been doing. doing in practice, so. Yeah, and and thank you also for the you know he's he's contributed a lot in our new book on regenerative medicine. He he he, he wrote on one chapter just for the nerves, so uh, it will be ready soon, Doctor Jeff. Okay. Well, everybody have so a wonderful thank day you for your contribution. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank have you a wonderful day. Much. Take care and thank you, thank Professor. You thank, you. thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you Thanks, thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. So thank, thank you, Jesse. You. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye now. Bye. 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 Thank you. Have a good sleep. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Jim. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Everyone. So, so, so tomorrow uh, we're gonna start at nine. I'm sorry for the slight technical problems today, but hopefully we can uh, we can uh, we, we know what to do already by tomorrow and subsequent days. So thank you very much and take care, everybody. Take care. Just inform your friends that uh, if they come in late late than 15 minutes, it might be difficult for us to accommodate them because I will turn over the hosting to the one that's lecturing. So if I, I'm not the one lecturing, so I might not be able to really do it. Okay, Ravi, do you have anything in mind? Oh, I'm so happy I was part, I just got to listen to this lecture. I mean, there's a stand there, there's a lot of experience from Stan as well. Yeah. And um, that's Jeff at his, you know, usual best, yeah? Yeah. So, they, I mean, I'm just uh, intrigued with a lot of information and that's amazing. I mean, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, no words to express this. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for your nice words, Ravi. Thank you. You have a great so day. Thank you so much. Yeah, you have a great day too. God thank bless you. you. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, thank God, you. God bless you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jojo, Mike, uh, Furious. Thank you, Conrad. Thank you, Alif. Alif, how are you, Alif? Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Jim. Thank you, Paul. Thank, thank you, Dr. Jim. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Tere. Thank you, Henry. Anik. Thank you, all of you. So, Henry, thank you so much. Yeah. Nice to have you here. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Desi. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Bye. Carolina, thank you. Thank you, Thank Carmen. you, Doc. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, Doc. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Uh, Ahmad, Alvin, thank you. Amir, Anshori, uh, Dadang, Hamza. Mucha, thank you everybody. Amir, uh, Dr. Adele, thank you so much. Uh, Mika, thank you, Mika. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sobrang ganda ng lecture ni Dr. Jeff Grabe. Oh, man. Sobrang galing. Pero, Doc, I think meron siyang co-host. Maybe the co-host would be better for us. We should try it. Um, para... Actually, for this plan, Pash, isa lang daw. Ah, so hindi pwede yung co-host. Co mm. Ang gagawin ko lang, eh, kung sino man yung mag-lecture, kasi ang instruction is, pag tinurn over ko yung uh, hosting sa lecturer, May iba pag tinurn over pag tinurn over ko na yung hosting doon sa lecture yung mga latecomers hindi na talaga makakapasok kasi yung magko-control nung mga incoming yung host na kaso <laughs> na uh, nagkaroon tayo ng konting ano pero mayor ka pa rin 2 hours tayo 2 hours we have a uh, we have around uh, 54 attendees. Okay. Ah, galing. So, so, galing, Doc. Sobrang nice nung lecture niya. Not ang ganda ng lecture niya. Ang ganda ng lecture niya. Doc Manrad. Si, ano, uh, si Chief. <laughs> Nakamute ka. Saan si Chief? Nandiyan pa ba si Chief? Oo, Doc. Ano, Chief? Konti na, tatlo na lang yata. Dito pa. Oh, si Chief yata. Tinatanong eh. ko kay Pache. Ah, nasa, nasa, eh. nasa San Francisco. <laughs> nasa San Francisco ka pala, Chief eh. Peggy yan, Peggy. Oo, oh, ikaw nasa Damuhan eh. <laughs> nasa Damuhan lang ako. <laughs> oh, ikaw nasa Damuhan eh. <laughs> Mapresko dito eh. Mapresko dito sa Damuhan. Oo oh, nga. <laughs> Bagay sa <laughs> sa'yo. Bagay. <laughs> Ano si Chief? Ayos ba? Ayos naman. Ano Mahirap balita? naman ang trabaho sa ospital. Ah, okay naman. Mahirap magpasunod ng doktor. <laughs> Sabihin mo lang kanila mag-mask lang. <laughs> Oo nga. Eh, natatakotin yung mga doktor eh. <laughs> Ayaw mag-duty? Ayaw ba mag-duty? Eh, bumabalik-balik na ngayon. Kaya nga, ang dami request. Ah, okay. Okay. So, asan si Jojo? Ni-record mo Dr. Jim, di ba? I-recording niya. Yeah, na-record na 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 siya. 